Parents today are bombarded with confusing and sometimes harmful information in regards to which foods are best to give their kids. Nutritional guidelines are constantly changing, and parents don't know who to trust for medically sound and proven advice that works. You are listening to Everyday Family Medicine on ReachMD, and I am Dr. Jennifer Cottle. Joining me today is Dr. Tanya Altman, a pediatrician and founder of Calabasas Pediatrics. Dr. Altman is a spokesperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics, and she is also an assistant clinical professor at Mattel Children's Hospital at UCLA. She practices in Southern California, and she is the author of the book, What to Feed Your Baby, a pediatrician's guide to the 11 essential foods to guarantee veggie-loving, no-fuss, healthy-eating kids. Dr. Altman, welcome to ReachMD. Thank you for having me. So your book, What to Feed Your Baby, is a fantastic book, and it offers advice on so many nutritional topics for babies and small children, really from dealing with common feeding problems to providing actual recipes for parents, which is something I really loved. You know, why was this book so important for you to write? Well, you know, I feel like feeding guidelines and recommendations have changed so much over the last five to 10 years, and there's a lot of information available, but, you know, parents are really confused. They don't know what food to start first. Is it okay to introduce peanut butter early? And through my 15 years in practice and raising my own three boys, you know, I really find that what you introduce your child in the first two years of life really makes a difference in what they will eat later on and if they will grow up to be healthy, non-picky eaters or if they will want to eat all the junk food and processed food and sweets out there, which really we know aren't healthy for them. But so the foundation that you give your kids early on can make a difference with their nutrition the rest of their life and also their health care. I mean, nutrition is so important for disease prevention. So that's why I wanted to write this book to help give parents simple guidelines to follow so that way they can raise healthy, veggie-loving, you know, no-fuss kids. You know, I I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the topics you discuss in your book. And one of the things you mentioned is the 11 foundation foods. Can you tell us a little bit about what these are and why you feel they're so important? Sure. So, you know, by no means are these all the healthy foods that you want to feed your child. But I have found that these 11 foods are really the basis for a healthy diet. They have everything in them that kids and adults too, actually. I have so many parents read my book and they say, oh my gosh, this is what I need to be eating every day. Um, But these are really the 11 foods that if you feed your child regularly starting around six months of age, they will get the nutrition they need and they will train their palates to want to eat healthy foods. So the foods are eggs, which is a very healthy source of protein, fat, and other nutrients. And you want to give the whole egg early around six months of age. You don't need to wait on egg whites anymore as we used to. Prunes, and prunes is kind of a surprising one, but prunes are very nutritious and they really help prevent constipation. And I see so many tummy aches and constipation issues in older kids. And if you get the babies and children used to eating prunes, it's so easy to treat and prevent these this as your children get older. Avocado, which is one of my favorite first foods for babies. It's super high in potassium and fiber and healthy fats. And really something important that when you start eating early, you like when you get older. I know a lot of adults that don't like avocado, and it's just because they didn't eat it when they were younger. I also love to put it on sandwiches instead of mayonnaise and other like non-nutritive spreads that people use. Um, the fourth foundation food is fish. And I know this sounds strange, but fish, especially wild salmon, is a great natural source of vitamin D, and there aren't very many um, vitamin D foods available. It has great fatty oils and fats that are important for brain development and eye health, and babies are growing big, fatty brains. So you want to get them used to eating fish early on, and about twice a week is, is probably enough. You don't want to do too much because of the mercury concerns. Dairy products is the next one, and um, I'm a big dairy person. I really feel that kids that grow up drinking milk are healthier overall. And we know it's one of the best sources, again, for vitamin D and calcium. And again, with milk, you know, how you introduce it to children when they turn one or when you wean breastfeeding really makes a difference as to if they're going to go on to be long-term milk drinkers. And we don't give milk under one year of age, but Greek yogurt is something that you can give kids at six months. And there's research behind probiotics being healthy and babies love yogurt. Like to them, it's ice cream. And so you can just give them yogurt instead, and it's a super healthy snack or meal that they can have any time. Chicken, and if you're a vegetarian or if you want to introduce legumes and beans, so that's another great source of protein and iron. 
And the most important thing about chicken is to feed your kids real chicken. If the first chicken they ever eat is a nugget, that's what their brain will think chicken should taste like. And then when they get older, you have to do the whole reverse you know, um, picky eating psychology of going back to get your kids to know what real chicken tastes like. So you can avoid that by feeding them healthy chicken made in your kitchen. Um, berries and citrus. Um, berries are really packed with lots of vitamin C and other antioxidants. And they're super powerful, yummy fruit that kids love to eat, especially when you introduce it to them early. Green veggies, of course, since we know they have almost every vitamin and mineral. And adults, the parents have to eat green vegetables too. Otherwise, the kids won't. So I see families that come into my office and I say, so what vegetables are you eating every day? And the parents say, oh, we don't like vegetables. And the kids say, oh, we don't like vegetables. And if you don't eat them and you don't have them in your house, your kids aren't going to eat them either. And then really quickly, the last two are whole grains, oats, quinoa, barley, um, anything with high fiber that's good for our intestines and our gut. And then water is the last one. You want to get your kids to grow up drinking plain water. So start offering sips around six months of age when they eat solids. Avoid juice, and your kids will grow up to be teenagers that like to drink plain water and adults that like to drink plain water, and there really isn't anything healthier than that. That is fantastic, and I'm really glad that you went through each food because I think it's really helpful not only to know the specific foods that you recommend, but also why and how they benefit um, babies and young children and how they will also benefit parents. Um, so thank you for going through that, and I think it's very helpful. You know, you talked about picky eaters and the idea of if they start with a chicken nugget, they may not want real chicken. And, um, you know, if the parents don't eat vegetables, maybe the kids won't either. So let's talk a little bit about picky eaters because you actually devote an entire chapter to picky eaters in your book. Um, you know, what sort of baseline advice could you give clinicians and physicians out there and parents actually about how to navigate children who are picky eaters? Sure. So I find that, you know, when I teach um, the future pediatricians at UCLA, is I, I talk to them a lot about how it's important at every single well visit and every, every opportunity you have to talk to parents to talk about what kids are eating. Because most picky eaters can be prevented by simply feeding your children real whole foundation foods early on and getting them used to a wide variety of tastes, things that adults eat every day and should be eating every day. Whereas if you start with too many processed foods and foods with added sweetener and color and things like that, that really changes their brain's perspective on what food should look like and taste like and smell like. And that's often what can contribute to, to being a picky eater. Also, the fact that a lot of parents might give in to their kids. And of course, you know, if you had the choice between a brownie and a broccoli, you know, which one would you choose? And so, you know, giving into your kids and just, you know, giving them what they want and what they demand since they don't understand good nutrition at that age also can contribute to picky eating. So there are a lot of great ways to prevent picky eating in my book. But if you end up already with picky eaters, which a lot of us have in our office and even in our you know, own home, you really kind of want to start from the beginning. And I have in my chapter, I outline the different types of picky eaters. And it could be the backwards picky eaters, like the ones that think that chicken is a chicken nugget, and you kind of have to work backwards to get them to learn what real chicken tastes like. Um, I talk about the kids that, you know, won't eat any vegetables and how you can start by taking them to the farmer's market and getting them involved in picking a vegetable and helping prepare it at home. And it might just sit on the table for a month and then on their plate for a month, and then they might kiss it and take a bite. But if you expose them to it every day and you eat it in front of them, they will eventually go back to it and start eating it again. So there are so many ways to help picky eaters. Don't give up and tell the parents not to give in to their kids. Really, parents are supposed to choose what kids eat and serve it, and the kids get to decide if they want to eat it or not. And when you're chasing the kids around the house, saying one more bite, one more bite, or you're letting them choose what they want to eat, then the roles are reversed. And that's when you've really lost the battle. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Everyday Family Medicine on ReachMD. I'm Dr. Jennifer Cardle, and I'm speaking with Dr. Tanya Altman, author of the book, What to Feed Your Baby. So let's go on and talk a little bit about the new trends in feeding. And I loved how you talked about this in your book, because oftentimes on television and the news, we see some of these newer, what we call trends in feeding, baby led feeding, vegan diets for toddlers, even things like pre-chewing, which you talked about in your book. You know, are there any in particular that you find particularly interesting and maybe just share your thoughts about them? Because I think some, some physicians might be very interested to hear what you, what you think. Well, I think, you know, as a physician, 
you do have to stay up a little bit on all the new feeding trends and what what parents are following because when a parent comes into your office and says, oh, we're following baby led weaning, you kind of have to have to have an idea of what that is. So whether you buy the book and read it or you just sort of Google it online, I think you need to sort of be aware. And so baby led weaning is one of the most common trends right now in baby feeding. And like all the fancy um, trends, there are good things and not as great things about all of them. So this one, for instance, I love that the goal is to get the babies used to eating adult table food as soon as possible. And really, that is one of the themes of of my book as well. However, we know that um, for the first few months, many babies really can't handle whole foods, and they can be a choking hazard. And if you're not pureeing and fork mashing and giving your kids soft pieces of whether it's vegetables or chicken or grains, they might become anemic and they might not learn how to eat and get the good nutrition. And I find that, you know, I have to explain that to parents over and over again when I say, oh, what foods are you trying this month? And they say, oh, my baby's licking zucchini. And I say, well, you know, you don't really get nutrition from licking zucchini, so let's just puree it for a few weeks, and then you can get them onto soft pieces of steamed zucchini, and then they can start eating whole zucchini very quickly. So, you know, I think um, with baby led weaning, the choking hazard is just one of my um, one of my biggest concerns. But overall, a lot of the themes in the book I like. In terms of vegan and vegetarian kits, you know, I find that um, – a lot of clinicians, when a family comes in and says, you know, we're vegan, we're vegetarian, the doctors might just say, like, they kind of shy away from that, like, oh, I don't know what to do, you need to talk to a dietitian, or, ooh, that's not healthy for babies. Now, I would never recommend that a family turns vegan or vegetarian when they have a little baby, but if that's the way the family eats, it is perfectly possible to raise a healthy vegan or vegetarian family. You just really have to educate the family, and it is going to be challenging. I mean, they're going to have to get a lot of nut butters and nuts in early on, a lot of beans and legumes and you know really make sure that the child isn't deficient in anything and if this isn't your forte as a doctor you can always bring in a dietitian or refer them out but make sure that whenever you have a family that has any dietary restrictions whether it's a true dietary restriction because they have celiac or they just really think they're gluten intolerant um, you don't want to just write it off. You want to, you know, ask them what do you eat and then take a look and see what nutrients the child might be lacking in and give them specific recommendations on what the family should be eating so that way everyone can get proper nutrition. And in my book, I do go over, you know, whether you're a vegan family, a gluten-free family, or whatever your real or, you know, not so real dietary restriction is, I talk about ways to get the proper nutrition in for your kids. This is so helpful. And I think, again, a lot of practical advice for parents and for doctors. You know, our final question before we close, and I just want to reiterate, um, it's fantastic interviewing you. uh, Your book entitled What to Feed Your Baby, A Pediatrician's Guide to the 11 Essential Foods to Guarantee Veggie-Loving, No-Fuss, Healthy Eating Kids. Um, It's really what we're talking about today. Um, And, you know, my final question really has to do with sometimes, I think, how a lot of us doctors feel. You know, when I was in medical school about you know, 15 or so years ago, I remember not receiving a lot of information or training on nutrition. And I have a feeling that many physicians probably feel this way as well. How did you become educated about nutrition? And really, what are your recommendations for doctors who want to learn more? And besides reading your book, which is a valuable resource, what other things can you recommend to physicians to help boost their knowledge? Definitely. You know, and I totally agree with you. Um, I grew up with a grandfather who was a cardiologist and who was into the Mediterranean diet before Mediterranean diets were cool. And so I learned a lot about the basics of nutrition from him. And that's sort of what made me interested. But I did find that when I was in med school and residency, I didn't learn, you know, how to teach a parent to puree a green vegetable. And so that was sort of one of the reasons why I wrote my book. So that way pediatricians wouldn't have to spend a whole half an hour explaining to parents how to feed each food to their baby at different ages and how to introduce peanut butter at six months of age now to follow the LEAP study. And so that's all spelled out in my book for parents, you know, how do you give an avocado to a six-month-old versus a nine-month-old and how do you feed scrambled eggs to an eight-month-old that might not have had it before and how much peanut butter do you need to melt into the oatmeal to be in accordance with the LEAP study to help prevent nut allergies in your children. You know, if you're interested, um, I think reading, you know, my book would be a great source for for anyone who's taking care of young kids, but there are a lot of other great nutrition advice out there. You know, I read every nutrition book that I can, and I also like to try everything myself. I would never recommend a food or a meal or a puree for a child or family that I haven't tasted myself. And sometimes I'll say, you know, this is a really healthy food. 
I can't figure out a way to get my kids to eat it. So if you figure that out, then let me know. And I learn a lot from my patients as well. Do you have anything else that you would like to add? Anything else that we should know? You know, I have three boys myself, and I have to say that I learned so much from them. And um, I find that, you know, when you do raise your own kids and you have to feed them and some of them become picky and some don't, and you learn what they like and they don't like, it just, you know, it really helps. And um, and I learn from every family that comes into my office because I take full nutrition histories, which I know we don't have much time for, you know, at all ages. And I find that the more you ask your patients and the more that you listen to them and you more that you give advice and you ask them for feedback, you know, try these foods and call me or email me in a week and let me know what your kids like and don't like and let's try to adjust it. And that's sort of how you learn how to, you know, guide your family toward good nutrition. And I find that kids that grow up eating healthy, they have fewer headaches, fewer school issues, fewer chronic diseases, fewer illnesses, and they sleep better. And so I truly believe that nutrition is really the foundation for good health. And that's why it's something that I'm so passionate about. And I really, you know, use in my office on a regular basis. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tanya Allman, for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Caudill, and to access this episode and others in the series and to download the ReachMD app, please visit us at ReachMD.com. We encourage you to leave comments and share this program with your colleagues. Thank you for listening.